There she is. All right, well, welcome everybody. I appreciate you being here for the final live event as we celebrate Native Plant, Plant Month in Arkansas. This is the Ask the Experts panel discussion uh, where we have three experts on botany in Arkansas. Uh, this panel discussion is being recorded and after the recording, afterwards the recording will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. Uh, just a quick reminder about our silent auction on biddingnow.com. That's B-I-D-D-I-N-G-O-W-L.com slash A-N-P-S. Uh, we're trying to reach a thousand bucks, and so far we uh, have raised almost that. I checked it before after Theo's last webinar. We were at nine hundred and forty-six dollars. So get on there and let's try to reach our goal of a thousand dollars raised for the Native Plant Society uh, through that sign on auction. Also, I'll, and I'll put that link in uh, the chat box here shortly, as well as the links where you can order uh, a, a Native Plant Society T-shirt, uh, especially the one for our spring meeting that I'm wearing here today, which has some great artwork designed by. Or the artwork is provided by Cheryl Hall, and then the design of the t-shirt was put together by Jennifer Ogle. Uh, and I'd like to encourage you to join the Arkansas Native Plant Society if you're not already a member. You can go to our website, anps.org slash join, and you can join right there on our website. So, uh, and just a quick plug for the next webinar uh, that we have coming up in our monthly webinar series, which we're going to be kicking off the monthly series uh, in June, uh, Britt Baker is going to be given a presentation on the glades of Arkansas on June 5th. That's a Saturday at 10 a.m. So join us for that. And then each month after that, we'll have a monthly webinar that we'll be bringing to you. Uh, and I'll be putting out the, the schedule for that on our Facebook and social media and our website for too long. So I want to introduce our panelists here. First, we have Jennifer Ogle. Uh, Jennifer manages the herbarium at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville. Uh, she is the co-author of Trees, Shrubs, and Woody Vines of Arkansas, and a co-editor of the Atlas of Vascular Plants of Arkansas, which was released in 2014. Uh, Jennifer has been active with the Arkansas Native Plant Society since 2004, and it currently serves on our board, uh, and she also serves on the board of the Fayetteville Natural Heritage Association. Uh, we also have Theo Witzel. Theo is a ecologist and chief of research for the Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission and the curator of the Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission Herbarium. He is a co-author with Jennifer of Trees, Shrubs, and Woody Vines of Arkansas, as well as co-editor of the Atlas of Vascular Plants of Arkansas, and has authored or co-authored more than 30 scientific publications and book chapters. Theo is also the co-founder of and the chief ecologist for the Southeastern Grasslands Initiative, which, and serves as a regional reviewer of the Flora of North America project. And finally, we have Eric Sundell. Eric has been an, uh, an Arkansas resident since 1980. He taught botany for 26 years at the University of Arkansas at Monticello. Uh, Eric is the founder of UAM Sundell Herbarium and was a charter member and past president of the Arkansas Native Plant Society. More recently, Eric edited the eighth revised color edition of Dwight Moore's T Trees of Arkansas, which was published by the Arkansas Forestry Commission in 2014. Um, just to avoid people talking over each other, I'll probably ask you to just enter your questions into the chat box at the bottom of the screen. And um, we already have had a couple submitted and we'll probably be generating some discussion through this. So just feel free to, um, if you want to, if you, I can't remember if the raise the hand feature is available on my version of Zoom, but if it is, and uh, perhaps we can, uh, or if you send me a private message requesting me to unmute your microphone, uh, I can probably do that as well to give you an opportunity uh, to ask a question uh, through audio as opposed to uh, the chat if you, if you feel like that would be easier. So, but we'll start off with uh, a couple of questions that we've already received. Uh, Eric, can, I, can I just interrupt quickly? I see that my name has changed to Joe Sundell. Yes. Uh, but that's not true. Uh, I'm still Eric Sundell with Joe's computer. Gotcha. I think I might be able to rename you. I'll do that right now. All right, how's that? Oh, let's see. Awesome. Oh, yes. Okay, you got me. <laughs> All right, appropriately named. All right, well, one of the questions we had that was submitted um, way back uh, when we first announced this Q&A panel, uh, Don Ford sent a message saying, in recent Monarch Conservation webinar, they had mentioned that there is now a newly discovered milkweed that is now considered native to Arkansas. He also saw somewhere that, uh, oh, that we could forward a question to us. So do we know about this milkweed that is now considered native to Arkansas? And between the three of y'all, just feel free to share what you know. Mm. 
I, I guess don't I can, know the new one. I can start this off. Um, that's true. So there is a, um, we had 20 milkweeds in Arkansas that we knew about. Uh, and that includes everything that was in the former family Asclepiadaceae. So that's the Asclepias, but also the Metelia and um, Sinecum or whatever the genus is now. Um, anyway, so all of the, the, the broader milkweeds, we had 20. And um, there was a new species of Matelia, which are the vining milkweeds called Matelia hertelliflora, the hairy flowered Matelia or climbing milkweed. And it was described from Texas. It was known only from an uh, area of, of dry habitats in, in Texas, I think in East Texas. And it turned out that a photograph that Eric Hunt took at Miller County Sand Hills Natural Area, which I talked about in my, in my talk earlier today, is such a hot spot for rare plants. It's got more rare plants, more plants on the state rare plant list than any other natural area in our system of natural areas. Something like 44 rare species on a small area. Uh, a photo he took of a vining purple flowered milkweed there was put on iNaturalist and um, somebody who knew this new milkweed from Texas got on and said, hey, that's it. That's this new species that was just described new to science a few years ago from Texas. And sure enough, you know, we went down and got specimens and, and more photographs and so on. And, and it's a species that we had collected before actually from back in even into the 80s, I think. And everyone assumed it was the other, the purple, the common purple flowered milkweed vine, Matelia decipiens. And uh, it turns out it's not. It's this closely, it's similar looking, but it's uh, a different species new to science. And that, that happens pretty regular. So, you know, we, we don't know everything about the floor of Arkansas. We're always making new discoveries. It's pretty exciting. That group of milkweeds, uh, there are several species east of the Mississippi River that you would have to differentiate with a microscope from our decipians. And this may be another case of the same thing. And then Theo, you, you should uh, remind people that you did rediscover the species of Asclepius that you and I once hunted for in the Ozarks. Oh, right, yeah, that's true too. So there's what Eric's talking about is there was a species called, or there is a species called um, Asclepius. Um, yeah, what was it? Which one is? <laughs> Uh, Asclepius stenopola, the narrow leaf milkweed, which is a dolomite glade and dry prairie species. There was a couple of old collections from like the 1950s and earlier from dolomite glades up in the Ozarks, most of which are now under Lake uh, Bull Shoals and Table Rock. And Eric and I went up in 2003 and maybe other times since looking for this thing, trying to rediscover it for Arkansas to no avail. And then uh, a couple of years ago, we found a couple populations in Baxter County and some beautiful glades on private land. And, um, and then Brent Baker from Natural Heritage Commission, the botanist, found it at another site, I think, in Fulton County. Oh, good. Round, but it's super rare. But I think he was talking about the new Matelia, Don, in his question. <clears throat> All right, thank you for that. That was really great. Um, let's see here. We had another question from Sue Standifer. Uh, Sue really enjoyed last week's webinar on ferns enormously, and she thanks you, Mr. Sundell. Uh, she was hoping, however, uh, to encounter mention of her favorite fern, which is Adiantum uh, fidatum uh, slash Aleuticum. Um, which when I looked these up, these were uh, the Northern Maidenhair and Western Maidenhair fern. Uh, also a common name she was familiar with was five-fingered fern. Um, and so she uh, submitted a query about it during the webinar last week and referred to it as five-fingered fern, but no one seemed familiar with that name for it. And so she just wanted an expert to acknowledge its existence in Arkansas uh, to see whether anyone agrees that they also think it is spectacular. She feels seeing, uh, very fondly of it. Um, and perhaps tell her if there is any or any better known common names for it in Arkansas. She said she first saw it deep in the woods at the foot of a waterfall in Newton County near Deer 45 years ago. Uh, and it grows in two distinct locations on her own property of 88 acres in Madison County. Now, 
she is saying that five finger fern is what species? Uh, the maiden hair fern, she listed the species name for uh, northern maiden, what I'm familiar with is northern, northern maiden hair fern and western maiden hair fern. And when I looked on Bonap, it looked like western maiden hair fern was more to the west, you know, and then I'm familiar with northern maiden hair fern here in Arkansas on my own property. But Adiantum pedatum. Correct. Yes. And then Adiantum aliuticum. I don't know if I said that correctly. But Say it again. Aliuticum. Uh, it's western maiden hair fern. It seems to be more common out west. I don't know that one. Aluticum, uh, like, uh, that, that like the Aleutian, like the Aleutian Islands, Aluticum. Aluticum. Okay, gotcha. So, how, are any of y'all familiar with Aluticum at all? Um, I know it's probably not likely in Arkansas, but is it? No, we have uh, Adiantum pedatum and Adiantum capillus veneris, the southern maiden hair, which cascades down the rock face. They're both spectacular. And I mentioned last week that Southern Maidenhair makes a great house plant. We've had one uh, really for 20 years in the same pot and it just keeps on growing. I'll just add that Northern Maidenhair is one of my favorite plants to encounter. So I'm with her on that. It's magnificent. <laughs> I really like it too. Yeah. It's beautiful. One cool thing about it, and I think it's where that name five finger fern comes, it has a really unique geometry, uh, the way the frond is shaped and it's like a fractal uh, geometry and it's seen in nature in other places. And one of, there's another plant in Arkansas that has an, a very similar um, geometry to it. It's not related at all other than they're both plants, but um, it's the green dragon. Green dragon. Um, yeah which uh, is Erasima draconium, and, and they both have that really cool uh, branching pattern. It's, I mentioned that, yeah, that's true. I didn't, I know it looks, something looked familiar about that growth pattern on green dragon. Yeah, you're right, it is very similar to the northern maiden hair fern. So, the first time I ever saw southern maiden hair fern, I was surprised how different it looked from northern maiden hair fern. Yeah, the formation of the uh, of the uh, sauri at the leaf margin is very similar. Ooh. Speaking of sauri at the leaf margin, um, I know one, long, several years ago, Theo, I'd sent you a picture of wood, marginal wood fern is what you identified it as, but what kept throwing me off in the key is that the sauri didn't really seem to be along the margin. And I kept coming up with a different one that you didn't have a record for in the Newton County. And so that's why I'd reached out to you. Is that sometimes, the case where the sori aren't always marginal? Or do you even recall what I'm talking about? I'm like, can you hear me, Theo? Uh -oh. I hear you, but yeah, I think I froze up for a second. Uh, okay. Did you hear the question? I whether the sori on uh, Adiantum pedatum were always marginal, as you said? No, for marginal wood fern, I had found, oh, right. and I was keying a fern out, that's why I kept going away from marginal wood fern, because the sori didn't appear to be on the margins, they were, oh, okay, right. so for marginal wood fern, are the sori not, all, and this was a question probably for Eric Sundell also, are they not always on the margins? They're close to the margin. Okay. And they might not be necessarily right on it. Uh, gotcha. But, much more so than the other the other species of wood fern or dropters that we have. Okay. And it's it's typically the only one uh, that's in dry upland rocky terrain. The other one's like okay. moist. Yeah, this was definitely in a rocky area, uh, high up along the edge of a gully along Whitaker Creek. Well, you could have other ones around there. I mean. I honestly don't remember if you want to send it to me again. I'd be happy to look at it. This was several years ago, you know. I oh, okay. A photo. I, mean, I wouldn't expect you to remember it. That sounds <laughs> I was good. just asking the question in general. Uh, How many right. dry opterists do we have in Arkansas? Do you know Theo off the Yeah. Off the uh, uh, we, got, we got Marginalis, we got Celsa, we got Carthusiana. We got Goldiana. We got a bunch of hybrids. 
and uh, like Australis. And then we have the non-native one, which is really spreading in central Arkansas. I found it all sorts of places this year, including natural habitats, and that's Dropterus. Oh, uh, Erythrospora. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a non-native one that's really spreading uh, pretty dramatically around Little Rock. There, there's a bunch of them. They're, they're bad to hybridize. They're, and they're difficult to key out, except for a couple of them. I wonder if marginalis does hybridize with the others. Do you know? That seems quite distinct in a way. I think there are hybrids with, with marginalis in the literature, for sure. <clears throat> Uh, Amanda Bancroft has a question. Uh, before she learned about problems with native cultivars, she had planted proven winners Viburnum nudum bulk brandywine and Itea virginica spritch little Henry dwarf, both labeled as natives. Uh, their sweet spire currently hosts the rare stinging rose moth caterpillar. Uh, should they leave the cultivars in the ground or replace with non cultivar native species? Uh, their goal is to prioritize native plants slash wildlife slash pollinators. And could you say the names of the species again? Yes, it was uh, Viburnum, Nudum, and Bulk is in quotations, Brandywine. Uh, that's all I'm assuming one native R species. Uh, and then Itea virginica, Spritch, Little Henry Dwarf. I get, they're just uh, culti uh, cultivated varieties of natives or native ours. Um, and she is saying that um, they, one of them currently hosts a rare stinging rose moth caterpillar. And she's wondering, should they leave those in the ground or should they pull them out and replace them with uh, truly native varieties instead of the native bar varieties? Well, I, I don't know about either of those specifically very much, but in general, we, we, and she, she knows this, or she indicated that she understands that there are problems with cultivars. And sometimes they're changed to the point where they're not only uh, not beneficial to pollinators and other wildlife, that they can actually be detrimental in some cases. Um, there's a really good article that Xerces Society has put out about, I think it was not maybe nine bark, that, where the, the leaf color had been changed so much that the chemicals in the leaf had been, those chemicals had been more pronounced and they were actually detrimental to herbivores that ate the leaves. So. In general, we like to recommend that you stick with straight species if you can. I wouldn't ever tell anybody to pull things out of the ground. Um, it, in general, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend that, but it, I guess it just depends on your, your goals for the site, your conservation goals, and, your, and, and she has some really great goals. If, if I know the site she's talking about. Um, so in general, we like to stick with straight species. I would encourage anyone, it's really difficult with cultivars because sometimes you know, all it will be on the, the label when you buy a plant, you won't even have a species name, you might have the genus name and that's it. Genus name followed by cultivar name. And it's extremely hard to research online and find out if you're even dealing with a native species. And like Cotinus, smoke tree, you know, you might have the non-native from Europe instead of the native one that you're planting and you won't even know it because you just see that, you, you see smoke tree or you see Cotinus is all you see. So we encourage people to do a lot of research before they they pick a plant and if it is a cultivar do extra research to make sure that you know the flowers haven't been changed to the point where they're the nectaries have been removed or, or changed to in favor of petals I think is what is the thing or the stam flowers. stamens yeah the doubled or like the the cone flowers are real notorious for that you know um just just do research make sure that that particular cultivar is still beneficial to wildlife before you buy it in general uh when you have a successful native species worth cultivating, uh, things have been elaborated. So there are several different forms. I always uh, uh, wonder why on earth anyone would want to buy a, a redbud tree with red leaves, which would uh, kind of obscure the beautiful red flowers as they come on and the leaves join them. Uh, uh, it, it just seems to be most natural. It would be best to, uh, to pick the natural varieties, but for the popular easy to grow natives, there are very often uh, a lot of uh, elaborated forms, cultivar cultivars. 
I know Mount Cuba Center has been doing research comparing cultivars uh, or na cultivated natives, nativars, uh, comparing those to their uh, more natural varieties. Um, I know they uh, funding, I believe, is kind of the, the big barrier there in trying to keep, get that research uh, going. There's, there's some research out there, but they just have trouble getting funding for it, even at Mount Cuba Center. Now, I believe one thing I read is one thing they found is our uh, blueberries, uh, based uh, compared to the uh, native blueberries, uh, the improvements we made are actually supporting more species as far as what they can tell so far. Um, that's one actual improvement that we may have caused with our cultivated blueberry varieties. But that's not always the case with the others, like Jennifer mentioned, with the double flowering species. Yeah, how, are, how are they in, increasing? What did you say about blueberries? Or uh, Yeah, that was one of the species where they were supporting more, I, I can't remember if it was a variety of different species or more species or what, what was causing it, but they found that the changes we've made to the wild blueberries were actually improving biodiversity or more actually providing more ecological benefit than the uh, more wild variety. Uh, and I don't know which species particular they're looking at. I know we have different species of blueberries. I'm just pulling this out from something, from my memory banks or something I read maybe a year ago about yeah. the research that Doug Talony was doing up there um, in Vermont. So maybe I can and some find of the that concern, article somewhere. Some of the concerns about cultivars, you know, getting, getting out and, and breeding back with our native wild populations and things like that as well as bringing in non-local genetics from far, far away and breeding traits back into, you know, back into our native populations. The, the amount of concern you need to have with that sort of depends on where you are. And, you know, if you're growing, I mean, aside from whatever concerns about the, the modifications to the plant itself, but if you're growing Viburnum nudum and Itea and there's not wild populations in your area, that's not a big concern that it would, you know, alter the local genes of the population or something like that. But if you back up against a site that has all of that stuff, or even there's some close by, it's kind of a different level of concern that you might want to have about, again, that genetic level of conservation. Because uh, there's definitely evidence that when we bring in something like, say, a, a pale purple cone flower from the upper Midwest, and plant it here, it, it might bloom at a different time. Uh, it might have totally different tolerance to cold and, and heat and drought. Uh, and so in some cases, something like that might just be a poor performer here, but in other cases, it might alter the timing of flowering or the hardiness of a local population over time. So that's, that's a big concern I have, but it's not a concern that's an issue everywhere. It really depends on where you are and what's around you. Definitely consider, yeah, what you might be near. If you're in the middle of an urban area versus a more rural area, there might be different things to consider there. Some people. I remember Kate Lincourt had an interesting uh, comment. Maybe it was uh, uh, in, in the other uh, society, um, the wild ones. She had uh, bought a, a second arrowwood viburnum for her yard, uh, native to Arkansas, uh, a species native to Arkansas, so she could get some cross pollination and hopefully some fruits. But it bloomed entirely at a different time from the one she already had. You know, so when you buy natives, you you don't necessarily know where they came from originally, where the seed is from. I have I have kind of a similar situation um, or story uh, that's even much more local than that. I was growing um, wild strawberry, Fragaria virginiana, from uh, and it was sourced from Sharp County, Arkansas. So this is up near the Missouri border, and um, it never flowered, or I mean, it always flowered. Excuse me, it never set fruit. And uh, somebody, it may have been Marianne King, but somebody told me, right, you have to have two genetically dissimilar plants in order to get to get fruit and uh, so you need to get an, another location or another start from some, a different population so I did I got one from the Blackland Prairies down in like Hempstead County southwest Arkansas 
and I brought it in and, you know, they, they run all over the place and you get a big population of them, but they're all genetically identical. Uh, but I brought it into the same garden with my Sharp County plants and they bloom at totally different times with no overlap. So I still don't have any fruit oh. <laughs> having a nice mixed population. So that's a real thing. And, it, and that stayed true for 12 years in cultivation. It's not, um, that's a genetic thing in, in those particular plants. It, it's not, um, it's not just because they were growing in two different zones or whatever. It's interesting. We have a wild Virginia strawberry out at our place and we get so many fruits each year. And I had no idea until you told me when I stopped by that you had to have two different plants because they do colonize and form these large carpets. So I just wonder, like, I mean, I guess we have two different, I mean, they're just two different individuals you're saying that can. Well, if, if you have a wild population, you probably, you know, you probably have all sorts of genetic diversity in there because it's reproduced. Okay by seed as well as this you know just as a clone but you know right. I, brought, I brought one start in and it it never made seed so all of mine are presumably I'd genetically identical so they have to be instead of being cloned they have to be okay so basically i would it have two to different be specimens at my property two individuals yeah that. two genetic individuals i guess gotcha how is explained to me right they, yeah, they get all over. I mean, even area that where they disturbed along our roadway when they paved the roadway, I noticed they're already growing in there. So, I mean, they don't, you know, we're not hurting on wild <laughs> strawberries. They, they're very aggressive. I was very surprised. Uh, so we, we like them. We see box turtles in there every spring uh, or June, actually, I guess, when they fruit. Uh, we just have yeah. like, at least a few different box turtles just all in there eating up those strawberries. So, it's always a treat. Box turtles have a sweet tooth. <laughs> and they're right there. Those strawberries are right there at their head levels. So, And just knowing how old the box turtles can live, you know, I wonder, you know, they might have been visiting that strawberry patch for the past 50 years, you know, and then suddenly we move out there and like, who are these people, you know? <laughs> but um, let's see, I think we have another question here. Sarah Gertz asks, uh, following up on her question in the last webinar about the Jacksonville Cabin Area's landscape, would you consider the uh, prairie pimple mounds that are found in the wooded bottomlands a sign that the trees should not be there, that fire suppression allowed the trees to grow, or are the trees a natural evolutionary stage uh, in that landscape? I guess he's speaking about secession. That's a great question. Um... Yeah, sorry, I, I guess I didn't make that point as clearly as, as I should have. I didn't really have, uh, felt, I felt like I was crunched for time. Um, no, so the, the, the primple mounds in those flatwoods are a, a remnant from another climatic period, totally different conditions than we have today. It was much hotter and drier, uh, but, it, but it, it reveals that there is a grassland um, heritage of that site, right? So. And because that's in the Grand Prairie region, it, it should have trees on it. If you were to clear cut that, it would grow back in trees. Um, but there is a sweet spot, it, but it is at the same time, it is more densely wooded than A, it probably was 150 years ago, and B, than it should be if you wanna have maximum biodiversity. So. What we would recommend, and if that was a state natural area, for example, would be to thin it out, to thin some of the trees out, to get light back on the ground, and to reintroduce prescribed, you know, to introduce prescribed burning or something into that habitat. But don't clear it. You know, it, it is it should be a woodland, which is uh, more open than a forest. Forest being a closed canopy, woodland being sort of a broken canopy where you have some light coming in, and the, the, the thing is most of the native plants that flower and you know, are at home in that ecosystem are sun lovers. So when the canopy becomes too dense in those prairie related woods, you lose the biodiversity. But it's not that it was prairie, it was prairie, you know, maybe 5,000 years ago or something like that, but it wasn't prairie probably in the last, anytime when we had the climate that we have now, it was probably more open woods with on the ground. If that answers the question. I hope it does. So I remember seeing a diagram that uh, I believe Dwayne Estes or maybe Reed Noss had posted on Facebook uh, showing that um, 
that grasslands were like the later successional stage after like, you know, forest, over woodland, savanna, then grasslands. Is that true? Or is that still what they consider grasslands to be? Is like this late successional stage in ecological development? Or what are your thoughts on that? No, I think it's, it's less about the successional thing and more about transitions along gradients of soil moisture, climate, um, soil depth, uh, okay. fire behavior, you know, all those things. Gotcha. Uh, and that, that whole succession model of is kind of old, old, um, out of favor, you know, it's, uh, okay. there's disturbance ecology and things like that sort of replace some of that. Not that there's not succession, but mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, it's just complicated. It, stuff gets real complicated. Gotcha. And it originated in the Eastern forest where it would be uh, natural to stop mowing your lawn and see what happens. And, and you get that classic uh, beach, beach forest. You know, just in the evolution of plants, you know, grasses, you know, were a pretty recent family, you know, they, you know, the trees are around before, you know, grasses, you know, kind of came about whenever, you know, things start to open up and create savannas during the, you know, Cenozoic era. And so I just didn't know if that played into any of the uh, successional uh, phase of it at all, you know, being, you know, coming later in the, you know, evolution of plants, you know, uh, or how that kind of plays into, you know, assembling the floral communities of the world and grasslands. Uh, I think they credit a lot of that savanna habitat to humans or our ancestors kind of coming out of the trees and getting down to the ground too. Um, Sue Tackett asks, regarding removal of invasive species, is it better to pull them out but from the roots or simply cut them at ground level? It depends on the invasive. I assume she's asking about maybe a woody invasive, a shrub or a tree probably. In that case, I would say it depends on the size of the infestation <laughs> and how, if you're gonna dig them up, Sometimes it's better just to cut them because you minimize ground, more ground disturbance, which could, you know, create a new space for more invasion of the same or other species. Um, it also depends on, on your comfort level with using chemicals. Sometimes cutting is a really good tool, but it, it's most effective if it's used in, in concert with an herbicide directly on the, the stem, uh, the cut stump. I know a lot of people are against using herbicide. In which case, if you are, you could just repeatedly cut until the plant dies. I've done that pretty effectively. I have a, like maybe a tenth of an acre that I had an infestation of bush honeysuckle on, and, and we didn't use any chemicals um, on that. We just cut it repeatedly, and um, it's, it's not that bad just to cut and, and go back the next year and cut some more. Um, but in large infestations, it becomes a different animal altogether. Something like garlic mustard, an herbaceous plant, you, you have to pull it and you have to bag it and get rid of it. Uh, you can't keep it on the site. And so it's, it's really important to get it by the roots. So it really just depends on the species you're dealing with. And also, like I said, your comfort level with different management options. Well, like Japanese stilt grass being an annual, uh, you know, this is what I've tried is cutting, going through and cutting it with a weed whacker right before, right after it's flowering, you know, before it goes to seed. Um, yeah. and that way it doesn't isn't able to reseed and have enough time um, but yeah you can if the small quantities definitely that's easy to pull up especially since it's an annual but that's um, right I have so much of it out of my place I go through with a wee whacker and just knock chop it off like you know late summer yeah that's a really effective effective way to deal with that one in yeah. small in small infestations but as you know it'll form acres of carpet you know just it'll just carpet an area for acres the reason i said that about garlic mustard that you have to pull it is because if you if you pull it and lay it on the ground the the, the fruits will continue to mature mm. and they could and and form viable seed so you have to get rid of that one altogether right bad one and i'm we're seeing if you're in the ozarks we're seeing more and more of it every year um it's becoming a real problem up here it's a wild edible, so eat it. Right. <laughs> Go out and gather it and eat it. That's right. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I think like what I'm hearing from you is it's very species specific and as far as the techniques you would want to use and also 
you know, kind of limited by, you know, your physical ability or the quantity you're trying to remove or, your, you know, just how much you can get, you know, whether you want, you know, what technique is best to use. Is that right? Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Someone's, oh, sorry, I don't mean to moderate. I'm gonna, I'm gonna mute myself again. No, you're fine. <laughs> don't apologize. You're one of our experts. Um, the only thing I'm an expert at, Eric, is, and I think you've learned this, is, is that procrastination. I've been, <laughs> I've been practicing. I've got at least 10,000 hours of that under my belt. <laughs> <laughs> well, I consider you an expert in a lot more than that. And so that's really what it depends on is your, <laughs> is what you're, what people think, right? You know, sure. it comes to expertise, sure. right? <laughs> it's a uh, an honor bestowed by others. <laughs> um, all right, William Allison asks, any advice for growing uh, Amphicarpia bracteata, which I think is a, looked it up. That's American hog peanut. I've never tried. <laughs> it likes a poor acid soil. In the wild, it's really common on like in the Ozarks on the chert wood. So it's in, you know, where you see pine and blueberries and stuff in the woods, that's the kind of places where you'll get um, heavy amphicarpia. In fact, the chert woodlands, when we burn them sometimes, that'll be the dominant ground cover. So if your site has too high a pH, you may be having trouble growing it. But I, uh, I've i grown it before. Hey, Allison, I've had it like come in on, uh, you know, in pots and stuff where I, I guess I, I got something else that had some seed in it. And uh, I don't know, are you try, I, you might want to grow it on like a trellis or something because it'll cover over everything like a blanket. Um, um, I've got a serious problem with uh, winter creeper, English ivy, uh, and honeysuckle. So uh, any kind of a native vine that will help to crowd those out. Mm. Oh, and a uh, Chinese yam oh. as well. So anything that will help to crowd those out uh, and is also edible for me and the local wildlife I'm, I'm a big fan of. It's welcome to take over. Right. Uh, somebody else asked about getting rid of cedars, lots of it, large and small. Any recommendations? What, what is the site like? Is it an old field or is it a glade? So that was asked by the username one PC iPad. So if I'm um, not sure if we've had to expand on that in the chat or I can or you unmute yourself or I can unmute you and you can ask directly if you would like. It's the reason I'm asking is in a sensitive site like a glade. Oh, there she is. It's it's woods and it's edges of woods, you know, like where we have the road. And they just, you know, they come up and come up and come up and my husband will cut them down sometimes. And I don't notice if the same ones come up, but after hearing about them earlier today from Theo, I would like there not to be any of them. They um, Sorry, I kind of felt that way. They don't re-sprout. We're lucky. Uh, it's not like a hardwood that'll re-sprout. So cedar, okay. you cut it off below the lowest branches. It won't come back from that one. So good to know. And the reason Great. they're often on the on the edge or under a power line or something like that is the birds will um, deposit them, you know, in places like that. And then of course they'll have sun and they do real well. Um, the other thing about cedar is the trees will either be male or female. So if you have a large female cedar, the ones with the little blue fruit on them, then that's a major source of baby okay. cedar. So sure. you know, trying to get those out of the neighborhood, if you can, okay. is, is an effective way to do it. But cedar, we're lucky that they don't re-sprout. Otherwise, there'd be no hope. Okay, thank you. Good to know. Maybe uh, like if someone were to start with the females if they notice those and get those first. If they have a ton and they need to, you know, that might help prevent the spread. Yeah, and and go back and remove the males. Yeah, and they're and they're larger. I mean, it would only be if they're large that they had fruit. So okay, the little ones don't reproduce mature enough. So you see one with fruit on it. That's that's a source of a great many in the future. Okay. Or when you get a lemon, you make lemonade. You could get a juniper berry and make uh, gin. 
<laughs> this is one of the reasons I loved Andrology so much. It's, it's Eric and his field trips and his little stories and, and things and <laughs> First knowledge, time of, knowledge of what you can do with some of this stuff. I mean, I, I, I knew that you could make gin out of juniper. Like that's a, it's an ingredient, but yeah. I didn't back when I first met Eric. <laughs> he taught me you could make lemonade out of the uh, um, sumac, yeah, sumac fruit nice. too. I learned that from him. <laughs> and it tastes good. It really <laughs> does. I don't. I'm afraid of most wild foods, but that's one I'll drink. <laughs> I am to too. <laughs> vitamin C. Yeah. What's when that? I first met Eric at a Master Naturals Bio Blitz, I believe at Pettigene or maybe Mount Nebo. One of the first ones back in 2011, maybe 2012, that uh, went on your tree hike out there. This is before the um, the um, uh, the color edition of Dwight Moore's book came out, but you still you had a dichotomous key for it though at that point. And that was yeah, I learned a lot from you there. Really enjoyed that. That was yeah. Was, it, was uh, that the walk where we saw that uh, huge stand of pawpaws? You know, no, I, I don't know. Country. It might have been. This was 10 years ago or more, you know, or at least 10 years ago. Okay. Yeah, that's um, let's see. Wild F, not sure who that is, but um, they asked, they listened to Eric's presentation on ferns and wanted to know. Uh, I wanted to ask if the fern that grows in the sunlight, uh, they think it's the bracken fern, which is everywhere right. along the roads in Northwest Arkansas. Is it a true fern? It is, uh, and, it, and it's a species that grows. I think it's worldwide in the temperate zone. It's also in Asia, I know. And it's a rare fern because it's adapted to uh, uh, full sunlight, uh, a lot of uh, uh, heat in some of those areas. And I guess the, the gametophyte, you know, the, when the spore germinates, it, it has to choose its uh, time very carefully so that it does have uh, some cool, wet, wet uh, temperatures um, to uh, finish the job, get the sperm and egg uh, together and start a new sporophyte plant. But it is a real live fern. Uh, it, uh, I, I don't know what the new family alignments are anymore, but uh, it's one with the uh, marginal sori. Uh, Jennifer or Theo, do you know uh, who's related to uh, to uh, the bracken fern? Any Anybody else in Arkansas? Any other ferns? I think uh, the the lip ferns, right? Tylanthes? Tylanthes? Myriopterus now. I think they're in the Pteridaceae with Pteridium. Okay, and, but, and you know, that may have changed. That may have changed in the last little while. Yeah, <laughs> moving the ferns group, around. Another group that can tolerate a lot more uh, heat and drought than most ferns. That was that was when we were in Arizona. That was the most common genus of ferns in the desert areas. Yeah, Kylanthes. Um, and I would, as far as bracken. From personal experience, I would be cautious bringing that into the garden. Yeah. Very aggressive, spreads underground and makes giant colonies in short order. But it is a really cool plant. But if you have a small uh, area, I would not recommend it in the garden. Yeah. Looks like I the person asked at a Cheryl Hall, um, wildflower Cheryl, I think that's what wild F means. And just to give a Quick uh, shout out to Cheryl. She did uh, provide the artwork for our t-shirts this year. This is Hypericum prolificum, uh, one of the more common species of St. John's wort here in Arkansas. And so we thought since uh, uh, some people claim that, you know, St. John's wort can be used to treat depression, that that would be a good species to use. Um, coming after the pandemic, whenever people might need to feel uplifted, by having this uh, spring meeting since we didn't really get to have any Native Plant Society meetings last year. So we want to thank Cheryl uh, for her contribution to our t-shirt. She did a really great job on those drawings. Uh, and Jennifer did a really great job putting the design together with her, uh, Cheryl's artwork uh, with the state of Arkansas and everything. And I uh, want to encourage everyone to go to the links I put here uh, in the chat uh, to order um, some of these t-shirts. If you would like one, they come in a variety of colors and t-shirt types, uh, not just the kind I'm wearing, but they have uh, tank tops, uh, 
all kinds of other options. So uh, I'm gonna repost the, the links here in case anyone would like to go on there. The money from these will go to the Arkansas Native Plant Society as part of how we're raising funds uh, this spring. So thank you, Cheryl and Jennifer. Yes, thank you, Cheryl. Lovely drawing. It worked perfect with the Arkansas outline too. Yeah. Uh, another question from Sarah. You're Kurtz. welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out in the woods. I couldn't get to my button quick enough, but yes, thank you for asking me. I enjoyed doing it. What a perfect place to listen to these webinars and panel discussions. <laughs> I wish I was well, out in the woods. <laughs> I thought I was going to miss it. And then I thought, well, I'll just listen on my phone. That works. <laughs> yeah, the wonders of modern technology, huh? You bet. <laughs> All right. Uh, another question Thank from, you. from Sarah Gert. Uh, do you know of any studies done on pokeweed that shows the amount of nutrients left in the leaves after one boil and dump, two boil and dump, et cetera? Very curious about the nutrient content of the foliage and the nutrients that get boiled out. Eric Fusilay, I feel like that's a question for you. <laughs> and I, I don't, honestly, not about nutrients. I know the point of boiling is to get rid of the, you know, potentially the compounds that'll make you sick, you know, so, uh, but yeah, it's a good question. I mean, what gets broken down and, you know, but at the same time, do you want to eat it without boiling it? I wouldn't think. What, what but, is the plant, Eric? What plant? Uh, pokeweed. I don't know, but be sure to do it at least twice. I had uh, an unpleasant experience with the common milkweed in Vermont. Uh, mm. We had uh, followed the directions in uh, uh, the old book, uh, you know, that original wild plant edible book. What was that? Uh, uh, Yule Gibbons? Yeah, Yule Gibbons. Many parts Talking of the Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and we, it, at, Back in the 70s, that was uh, very common all over Vermont. It probably still is, but uh, it's, it uh, cautioned you to boil it and dump the water twice. Mm. And then the third time you could eat it. And we uh, tried it successfully. And then some friends were uh, visiting and uh, they said, oh, really? Uh, gosh, let's, uh, we'd like to do that too. And uh, we'll cook supper tonight while, uh, while you're gone. We, ha we had to work. Uh, so when we came back, uh, they served us milkweed, and as we were eating it, they said, "Well, we ran out of time, so we didn't uh, we didn't uh, uh, boil it more than once." Oh. And sure enough, three uh, three out of four of us lost our dinner in front of the wow. house that night, uh, oh. and called the emergency room just to find out what else was in store. I hadn't studied botany at this time, oh. but the uh, definitely with milkweeds, I don't know what's in uh, uh, poke, but definitely with milkweeds, the uh, uh, the cardiac glycosides come out with one or two of the initial uh, boiling episodes. Hmm. Interesting. I haven't tried milkweeds. That's one wild edible. I don't want to forage just because of you know how important they are for monarchs and other caterpillars, but. Uh, just from what I've read, um, you know, if, even after boiling, if there's any bitterness that persists, you, it's just just not eat it yet. You know, that you have to get rid of the bitterness. But and I also know that some of that older literature on wild edibles is known to have errors in there uh, that have been <laughs> updated. And it's not to say any of the new stuff still does not have errors in it that we won't find out until later. You know, that's one of the dangers there. But, well, we had a friend in Vermont who had a, uh, an interesting recipe for dandelion wine. It was mm. a codger who uh, was a retired dairy farmer. He, he said that he liked uh, dandelion wine, and his recipe was that you take a fifth of Jack Daniels and a head of dandelion and mix them up and taste it. And if it tastes too strong of the dandelion, you get another fifth of Jack Daniels. <laughs> and that, that was... <laughs> That was a local Vermonter's <laughs> recipe for using the native, well, the non-native uh, plant in this case. Right. Um, I don't have any insight on the on the poke pokeweed. Sorry. Uh, Kent Bonner mentioned, um, and I haven't tried this personally, but if you come across some poke and it's already produced that. You know the red compounds you know that indicate you know it's too late then you can 
cut it off at the base and gather the new leaves that spray out, re-sprout. Um, that's one way to get the fresh greens if you, you know, arrive a little too late in the year. Uh, Phyllis Stair has a question. She noticed that more trees have galls on them this year. Will this affect the tree and is this caused by too much rain? Danny Carson had a question about that in this morning's paper too with the gouty oak gall, the big wooden galls that form on the, the uh, red oaks, especially oh. on cherry barks where we always used to see it. Uh, but I, I, I don't know more, uh, really anything about conditions that favor them. Well, we had some jumping oak gall that was very uh, widespread in Benton County, like Bella Vista area and out where I'm at, Eastern Benton County, this was maybe a couple years ago. Um, I was looking into it because a lot of our foliage was, you know, looked bad. Um, and it was, they were saying, and I reached out one of our foresters at local extension office and uh, he also confirmed this along with the, um, like an arborist friend who's familiar with jumping up ball. Uh, they all said that, uh, you know, the previous year spring uh, caused an increase in that uh, mite or whatever it is, that uh, parasite that causes that gall. Uh, and so that following year, they were at the stage where they were um, causing that foliage uh, damage. So I think maybe it depends on the insect or the parasite or the mite or the bacteria that causes the gall, what its life cycle is and what the conditions uh, environmental conditions such as rain or whatnot, you know, how that affects different points, you know, as far as how well they'll survive or do well, you know, would be my understanding of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have a lot of wasp galls uh, at our place, and we just get those every year. So they seem to not vary. <laughs> well, I, th I think that's, uh, that's a, a kind of a common theme that the weather influences especially uh, uh, drought versus uh, sufficient moisture influences the growth of fungi. I remember an explanation for the uh, hordes of crickets we would have in Southern Arkansas every couple of years. And the entomologist at UAM uh, said that it did have a lot to do with uh, how moist the summer was, uh, that if, if there was sufficient moisture, the fungi would destroy a lot of crickets. And, and these were, uh, you know, these were plagues of crickets uh, when we got them, not, not common, but every couple of years. And a, a, a dry year would allow lots of crickets to survive and thrive and then invade the uh, strip malls. Oh, wow. <laughs> crickets are edible. Uh, you ever eat them, cook them though cook them that way you don't get any parasites from them but grasshoppers we we like those out at our place cook them until they're red like crawfish and then uh that's kind of lets you know they're done but they taste delicious it takes at least for me it took a little bit to get over the thought of eating a grasshopper but uh once you've tried one man they're like lazy potato chips you can't stop oh, they like you do you season them do you, do you season uh, them well, I have them cooked do? them with wild garlic uh and then yeah a little bit of seasoning and butter and all that like you know fried them up but I mean, and raw, I mean, not raw, but unseasoned, I feel like they're, they're good too. I mean, they tell you, they have like kind of a, a meaty, I don't know, kind of the same flavor I would associate with like a nut or like wild green briar or um, um, trillium leaves, that sort of flavor, kind of a nutty, proteiny flavor. But, you know, you just want to make sure you cook them sufficiently so that you don't get any of the parasites in them into your system. Some people grow crickets agriculturally, you know, and then make cricket flour. In fact, cookies made from cricket flour that were pretty good, surprisingly. It's the, the source of protein of the future. <laughs> I, I haven't heard that in a while, but I used to hear a lot about that like 10 years ago, just that crickets were the next protein wave. Yeah, I think they're just, it's really easy to grow it. Less, a lot less input. I think yeah. Sarah Gertz wanted to know, Eric, how you kill the grasshoppers. Oh, we uh, stick them in our freezer <laughs> or put them in a bag and stick them in a freezer or sometimes just put them right in the frying pan, you know, but uh, or when, yeah, so I mean, that's how, <laughs> but catching them's the hard part. Mm. But when you have a ton of them, it's not so hard to catch them. You just go out with a blanket or something and, and get them right up. But 
you know, we would put a lot of them in a bag and put it in the freezer and then pull them back out and cook them. I know the more salt and butter we put on those milkweeds, the better they tasted. <laughs> That's the thing about wild edibles, you gotta acquire the palate for a lot of it. I mean, our palate is so adjusted to modern, you know, industrial society food, you know, and high sweets and less bitterness, but yeah, it's a, it's a different palate for sure. Okay, um, since we're almost to four o'clock, I'm, I'm gonna ask the final question. This is one question I've had. Um, and what are some plant species that would indicate that a forested area was once a grassland, prairie, or a glade? That you saw it in a forested area? So there's a whole bunch of what we call indicator species of um, that a site was historically more open. So the general thing is a lot of the upland, the dry, let's say in the drier upland habitats, those are the ones that really, for the most part, were more open historically than they are today, uh, of the wooded community. So there's this whole suite of sun loving grasses and wildflowers that you might find on a roadside against the edge of a closed, you know, closed woodland, closed forest, um, or in a power line cut that maybe goes through one that should be, or historically was throughout that, that area. You know, and, and we, we sort of split the plants into different groups. There's what we call, on, on one scale, you have weedy plants on one end and what we call conservative plants on the other end. So a conservative plant is something that usually lives a really long time. It has a high fidelity to an undisturbed, high quality natural community. Um, it um, maybe is not a, it's not a good colonizer of, of disturbance or of new habitat. Things like, for example, Indian paintbrush or liatris or pale purple coneflower. These are plants that you'll usually, if you ever find those, those are probably in a pretty intact, nice kind of place. And those are all sun lovers. So the other thing is we rank plants on the scale of whether they're shade tolerant or sun loving, or what we call ceophytes, the ones that grow in shade and heliophytes, which means sun lovers. Uh, so what we look for is conservative heliophytes, plants that are found in high quality, intact grassland habitat, but also have to have sun. And if you find those on the margin of a site, those are good indicators that it was more open historically. And the other thing to say about those drier upland habitats, they don't typically have any or very few shade tolerant plants in the, in the understory of the woods. Pretty much everything in there that is going to flower needs some sunlight. Now it's different from like a moist mesic hardwood forest on like a north slope or down in a ravine. We have a lot of spring ephemerals that, that are shade tolerant or they do most of their growing in the very early spring. That's a forest community. Those are forest species. That's a natural forest. Um, the stuff, I mean, you can almost look at the trees and figure it out. If you've got shortleaf pine and post oak, a heavy oak component, um, pretty good indication that that was somewhat open historically. Those species need light to get going. On the other extreme, if you have uh, magnolia and basswood and maple and beech, that's a forest. That's a moist forest community. That's the general basic way I look at it. Want to add anything? Well, I think I, oh, go ahead, Eric. Well, I want to ask you a question, Jennifer, if we have a minute, and that is yeah. uh, about the uh, University of Fayetteville Herbarium uh, does the future look bright administratively? It sure does. <laughs> I'm feeling very good right now. I just uh, recently uh, was able to, I, I guess we call it sustainable funding through the university. They've decided to cover all of my operating expenses, all of the herbarium's operating expenses from now on. Uh, I'm sure based on performance, <laughs> continued <laughs> progress and, and good news from there. So that, that has been a significant development for me. I don't know that the, the department itself has ever supported the herbarium at that level before. I know the graduate school has, um, 
So this is kind of a new development that's just extremely encouraging. Um, and it, as you know, not everybody knows, the, the University of Arkansas Herbarium is the oldest and largest herbarium in the state. And it's almost as old as the University of Arkansas itself, um, but it recently was moved into a new facility that um, at a significant cost to the university. Um, just before I started as collections manager, it was moved into this new space. that was much better for the collection itself. And so that in itself was very encouraging. And then this recent news has also been very positive. That's great. great. Yeah. It also survived an attempt to shut it down about 15 or 20 years ago now. 20. Eric, about early 2000s, 2003 or something like that. Anyway, I feel like 03 is the, is the year. I, you guys did a big campaign to save it. I was going to say the Native Plant Society was absolutely critical to stopping that from happening. There was a big campaign and they they sort of tolerated the herbarium for a while and it barely kind of didn't get much, much, um, many resources. And then it was shuttered for a couple of years before Jennifer, they hired Jennifer now. So this is great news. This is a vital resource for Arkansas botany. And uh, it, it came about as close as you can get to getting, getting lost. And uh, yeah. so, so that's great news, Jennifer. Thanks for- Yeah, for and one us. more thing is, is I give a lot of credit to the chair of our department. He understands that we are just stewards of this thing and we're temporary, but this herbarium is a permanent institution within the university system. He just has a, a he understands that. Like, I, I haven't seen a non-botanist uh, understand it before. He's a cell biologist <laughs> by training. So it's pretty impressive. There's cells in every one of those plant studies. That's right. <laughs> good point. And this is really kind of a good segue uh, because I mean, uh, mentioned that we're going to be having a monthly webinar series starting in June, and Jennifer is going to be giving our November one on the history of the UARC herbarium. So uh, make sure you sign up for uh, these monthly webinars that will uh, start in June and we'll go through the end of the year and hopefully beyond that as well. Uh, we're going to start it off. Uh, in June, on June 5th at 10 a.m., that's a Saturday uh, with Glades of Arkansas with Brent Baker. He's going to deliver that one. Uh, so I encourage all of you to uh, reach out and uh, get on the list uh, to receive the Zoom link for that. So first, I want to thank our panelists here today, uh, Theo Whitsell, Eric Sundell, and Jennifer Ogle. Really appreciate all you uh, participating in this and sharing uh, the question, uh, your expertise and knowledge and answering people's questions. This has been really great. And again, just kind of want to give a plug to funding. Uh, help us out with the Arkansas Native Plant Society. Go on to our silent auction website, or you can donate just an amount of money. I mean, we do a lot of great stuff here in Arkansas, like they mentioned earlier, uh, helping to save the UARC herbarium. We fund a lot of research on native plants, uh, have a small grant uh, program to help fund uh, native plant ed education and conservation projects in all, all across Arkansas. Uh, so really appreciate y'all being here today. Again, the recording of this panel discussion is going to be uploaded to our YouTube channel. Uh, you can find out more about the Arkansas Native Plant Society on our website, amps.org, and I encourage you to join. Uh, just go to amps.org slash join, and you can join right there on our website. So uh, thank you again, and uh, we'll, we'll see y'all in June. Thank you, Thanks, Eric. Eric. Thank you for Bye, everybody. Thank, thank you. you.